Welcome to Community Close-Ups, a podcast series highlighting the unique and talented individuals in our community. I'm Bo Cameron. And I'm David Warner, and we're recording live at Microsoft Ignite. Bo, how's it going? Good. Good. Survived day, day one. Lots of new updates on the SharePoint side of things. Uh, how about yourself? How's your conference going so far? It's good. It's my first time, so all of it's overwhelming. Big, huge, but everybody is so collaborative and nice, so it's really amazing. Yeah, I, you know, I'm coming. This The first time I came to this conference was Tech Ed. 2011 or 2012 here um, and it's amazing to see how that conference has changed to this I think it was like 12,000 people at the time and now we're over 30,000 people so it's a whole sea um, of people that you see every day um, so it's pretty easy to get lost around here but uh, with with all the new pe- people we probably have some new listeners as well so uh, why, why don't you talk about what community close-ups is and why why we're here yep so community close-ups is uh, an endeavor to bring the personal side of the community to the community right so a lot of us who are engaged in the community come to these events like ignite sharepoint conference and others come that are not as engaged and when they do they want to start a conversation with us and they don't often don't exactly know where to start we have such technical history together it's still very collaborative but all we do is show off podcasts and tech and blogs and demos so that's an awkward conversation so to bridge that gap we focus on the personal side of everyone so that when we all do come together there's an easier conversation to start because lo and behold we have something in common like Hugo being a chef or uh, Jared being a pug lover or something like that and surely there are other chefs out there or other pug lovers so it helps start those conversations yeah I agreed it's, it's really nice having the show because we eat even if I met someone before you always leave learning so much more about that person. So it's, it's a really enriching experience. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited for today's guest um, because he is one of the, the most supportive member of our community and, and help, helps us thrive. Uh, he's a senior pro, our principal program manager for SharePoint OneDrive Engineering. Vesa Yuvenin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. So why don't you start out helping everybody know who's Vesa, where are you from, your family, just a little bit about. Yeah, so uh, like I said, I'm a principal program manager in OneTribe SharePoint development platform. Uh, I'm based in Helsinki, which is slightly weird. Uh, so I basically said, yep, I'm not going to move to Redmond, your call. And they said that, okay, it's, it's fine, we're going to use you anyway. So we can talk about the career and everything else slightly later, obviously. Um, I have a wife and a kid who's eight. Uh, on the second grade right now, a dog and two cats. So, and I work from home. So, and we've seen your dog, so we'll talk about that a little bit sure. later. Seems like a slight uh, connection between him and Parker, the mascot of the Ofsted PMP. Maybe yeah, it's not a intentional. So ah, okay. No, no. All right, good. <laughs> well, so you travel a ton, right? I mean, a ton, probably more than anybody I know. Uh, we had asked you one of your favorite places or most interesting places to visit. You said the Mongolian deserts. Yeah, that was interesting. So back in 2001, if I remember correctly, we did a Trans-Siberian train uh, with f- uh, five guys, um, which was a really fun trip. Uh, it was a, at the time I was like 25 or 26. You can calculate how, how old I'm now. <laughs> 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 but anyway, it was kind of at the, the getting old and getting, getting uh, taking responsibility of yourself and going to the, the, the Trans-Siberia, taking care of all of that hassle, uh, going to Moscow back in 2001 wasn't an <laughs> easy thing to do. <laughs> well, it was, but it wasn't too bad. But it's always kind of those scary things as well. When you're um, young, especially. When you're young, right? especially, yeah, exactly. And then staying one week in a train. And then we popped, uh, jumped from a train in Mongolia, in Ulaanbaatar, stayed there like three days. And one of the best thing ever was staying uh, one night and e- well, two days, basically. Or was it three days? Anyway, uh, in the Mongolian desert. So we had our own family who actually had some extra yurts because they whatever tents they are and and on those we then stayed for an extra day um, without any electricity or anything so it was a brilliant experience so is that even legal today no electricity (laughs) no internet (laughs) so is that the uh, the equivalent of what we do here? So we graduate college and then we just do a six months day in Europe and we just backpack around well, Europe. Yeah, kind of, kind of. That's that's one way of thinking that it wasn't. It's not as a let's say everybody doesn't do that. I'm sure, but people do backpacking in in Thailand, in in Vietnam, and all of that. So uh, our trip actually went from Moscow, from Helsinki to Moscow, to Lampator, to Beijing. Then we flew to Bangkok and then we went to the islands and then we go to the Kuala Lumpur. Uh, in Malaysia, and, and then few guys actually continue to Australia. That <laughs> sounds like a reality show where you're <laughs> yeah, hopping exactly. all over the place. <laughs> exactly. That was a brilliant trip. So, 
But uh, but the Mongolian desert, I really liked the, the the fact that there was no electricity, there was no nothing. The, the sky is just brilliant on night uh, because there's no no what is it like bouncing the lights. Yeah, yeah, exactly, cool. exactly. That's brilliant. Which is by the way why I love our Lapland cottage as well. So we do have nowadays a Lapland location for me and my family where we go to rest and it doesn't have an electricity there's no electric lights or anything so it's oh, nothing no nothing so wow. in in the de desert what's what's the cuisine like uh, <laughs> it was basically <laughs> mutton uh, whatever the mutton is the, the local uh, animal yeah. and rice so nothing more than that then you just, you, you just cook over open fire fire uh, well the, the family took care of that okay so there was a local family which basically on the area where we were staying and it was a, a there was a fence um, on top of that because there's a, a you never know who's gonna actually walking the the, the the animals are walking around side of the fences as well so that, that was really great funny enough one of my friends uh, who were on the trip was a, a veg vegetarian and tried to explain without a common language for a Mongolian family that he's a vegetarian <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> okay fine I'm gonna just eat just eat the rice right at that point right <laughs> yeah. Goodness. The so cultural differences are quite huge. So, <laughs> uh, so no, no electricity, but you do say that your best way to start a day is with a coffee. Sure. So, were you yeah. a coffee drinker at that point? And yeah, did you I've always been a coffee drinker. So, so when I even when I studied, well, I I, I drink my coffee black, so I can drink whatever <laughs> as long as it's dark and it has coffee. So, um, it's just habit. So, so you just use the open flame and had it, or did you go without? Uh, in there, uh, they actually, I think the family actually gave us coffee, if I remember. So that was a staple for them, yeah, too, yeah. right? They're yeah, like, we're not, exactly. you know, yeah. <laughs> this isn't 100 years ago. We have yeah. coffee. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Maybe the desert, but we have plenty of coffee. So do you have any interesting stories from that trip? Because we asked you before, what, uh, what's the scariest thing you've done? And you've skydived or jumped from a plane. Yeah, I've done uh, that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from that story, that trip over so 25 five gates uh, five guys yeah there's some stories but <laughs> we, never, we shouldn't actually talk about that stuff not podcast appropriate no no <laughs> no um, all of us have been young at some point and yes we might do mistakes and all of that and that's that's human life. Um, but for the scariest thing uh, ever uh, i think actually the actually the jumping from a plane wasn't as scary as jumping from a benji a really high benji jump because in when you do a benji jump you actually are being raised slowly to the direct to the, the, the height and then you kind of realize where you are when you're jumping from a plane it doesn't feel like it's reality it's, it's so like far it's away so far away and you're like well okay fine i'll just go and your brain is yelling <laughs> <laughs> so then, have you jumped multiple times two times okay so not more than that so but all by myself so not a tandem uh, which ask. is interesting so yes. did you have to do special certification yeah. to be able to go alone yes. first yeah. so what made you say uh, uh i'm not going tandem i'm going directly for the solo um, I, I for me that was like well going over the the the, the excitement or or kind of a going over the limit so to say and uh, at a tandem is like people do that uh, going to true training and I was actually intending to continue jumping the problem in Helsinki however at the time was uh, that it wasn't super professional so whenever you go to the, the parachute club uh, you might or might not get the jump so it, it was really dependent on the on the timings on the airplanes and the airport and all of that stuff so it wasn't really suitable for me because I was already working in IT so it would be more like I need to know when I'm able to do the jump I can't stand there like five hours and maybe do the <laughs> jump that's that's something interesting so wow that's interesting so what what's the what's the feeling like when you're floating uh, it's it's weird and yeah. uh, the, the 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 level of adrenaline which kicks in is just tremendous um, the, the, but you can't actually understand that unless you jump so and during that the, the next day or that evening it's better not to actually talk with anybody who hasn't jumped so, so <laughs> because they would be like what, why do you keep on repeating this what, what? <laughs> <laughs> I've done it the, is really cool I've done the indoor skydiving I've yeah. not done the actual real deal uh, and, and surprisingly so I get motion sickness yep. when I'm flying and I thought no way with all that wind in my face and obviously when you're floating in real air you're gonna have wind in your face I totally got sick it was the weirdest feeling because I'm like I'm I'm not I'm just floating down but in the wind in my face when I'm getting sick and and that too was a weird feeling it's just you're just kind of floating and you got to learn how to ride the air pockets and yep. stuff like that and they simulate well, them in that well I have serious control issues so that's one thing I will never do is jump from a plane but I've done like par parasailing and when you're up that high like there's wind but you don't hear it, it, it 
it's a lot more quiet up there than you would think it would be. So I was wondering if it's the same exact way or if it's just super loud as you're coming down. I I, I can't remember Remember. how it was. And it was on a two jump, so not like like certified jumper anymore. (laughs) So um, but it was it was definitely one of the scariest things to do. So was it was the pre jump? Or the post jump, probably the pinnacle of it's the adrenaline the rush. The pre jump. Well, now to be fair, the the when you actually get down, at least in my case, um, the the adrenaline jumps when you're actually in the ground. Um, so because when you're going up, you're you're scared. Uh, the Jittery. You're really, really scared. And when they open the door, I still remember that it's like really <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> gone critically wrong with my decision making. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And there's always an option to go back on the pl- uh, plane uh, to the crown, but hey, you, you don't want to do that. You want to actually go to over the limit. So. Yeah. And you mentioned La- Lapland. So this is a, a camp or a cabin yeah, um, yeah. In, the so w- in the woods. It seems far, I think it was like 400 miles away or kilometers away. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, 450 miles away from Helsinki. So Helsinki, it's funny enough, people don't actually quite, uh, when, you, when you have a look on the map of the world, uh, you don't actually realize that, that Helsinki is at the same level as Anchorage. Hmm. Because in your mind, Europe is actually slightly right. down uh, in the southern area. Uh, is it Madrid is in the same level as New York, which is super weird as well. It's like, really? Yeah, that uh, is interesting. <laughs> uh, and uh, London and Seattle are actually at the same level. That's why it trains probably <laughs> <laughs> the same <laughs> amount. <laughs> but yeah, so from Helsinki, we, we drive 750 kilometers, which is around 400 miles or so uh, to the north. It's not technically actually Lapland. Uh, I always say that it's Lapland. But for anybody who's in not in Finland, you wouldn't actually understand the difference. But uh, reindeers are herding free there and all of that stuff. Um, you, we've seen mooses running around. You can bump to a bear, which is freaking terrifying as well. <laughs> um, but it, well, we haven't. Um, and there's actually a, so my, my wife's parents uh, or my wife's mom is actually from that location. So they had some land over there and they built a cabin which doesn't have electricity. To be fair, it has the, the generator if needed, so we can actually charge whatever batteries and all of that. Um, and nowadays in Finland, well, for a while already, we are in Finland, so 4G actually works. So yeah. It's I was just going <laughs> to mention that. It's like, yeah, there's no technology there, but somehow that's yeah. still tweets <laughs> photos <laughs> in. Yeah. It's, it's super weird because that location is 50 kilometers or like 30 miles, miles uh, from the closest grocery stores and, and that anything. So there's no neighbors, no nothing, but of course you have a 4G. <laughs> Why wouldn't <laughs> download speed in 70 megabytes down and whatever? I mean, Twitter is a basic human right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Then it actually, in Finland, it is. So basic human right in Finland includes a 10 megabyte connection. Really? Yes, which is weird. Uh, at, one one hundred my city. at one one hundredth the cost that it costs us in right. the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous. So you say there's no electricity, there's a uh, uh, generator. Do you think that... Was that purposeful? Did it, I mean, did you build that way, and are you going to keep it that way well, just because you like the? We, we got seclusion? the place, so we got the place from the from our wife's parents. Uh, they can't take it, uh, use it anymore. They're getting too old. Uh, so there was a generator. Now, to be fair, the generator makes so much noise that it's not nice. Mm. Uh, so I would prefer that it's solar panel placed. Uh, but then again. We go there so rarely, unfortunately, it's so far, mm. um, that do we want to invest for the solar panels? Uh, so what I did actually this autumn, uh, when we went there, we bought plenty of large batteries, uh, The basically whatever the mobile battery thing is, but they have like 150 times a mobile phone thingy. So mm-hmm. that should be enough for whatever week. Yeah, or so. one of the things we, we've done is they make adapters for car bat- the batteries you yep. just bring them in hook them up and you can have it for all summer long for the three yeah. three weeks you were there you can charge up your your phone but yeah you do a lot of fishing there right uh, we had seen you in a fishing boat does the family go out with you too or just no, is that is no, that Vesta time no that's my time so, so i don't technically i don't do that much fishing anymore uh because i'm horrible at fishing i don't i don't get the fishing so <laughs> I, I feel you. I uh, was up at SPS Twin Cities with some people, and we did ice fishing. Yep. And to me, I'm thinking it's ice fishing. You you drop a line, yep. and, and you just wait for the fish to bite. There was four holes and four of us, and two of us caught absolutely nothing, me and a local Minnesotan, and two of the other guys from Texas caught. And so we were like, no, this is ridiculous. Let's switch spots because all the fish are just coming to you first. We switch spots. They start catching in the spots that we were, yep. and then we catch nothing. Yep. Yep. I'm just, so I feel you when you say bad at fishing. <laughs> if I can't catch an ice fishing, I'm not going fishing anywhere else. So you said your favorite food is Thai. Yeah. 
how does that how does that tie in? Is that no pun intended? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's because I traveled in Thailand for uh, quite a few times. So um, that was one of the, at the age of 25, 20, whatever, we, we really enjoyed going to the Thailand, to the si completely silent islands. Uh, the, the Koh Phangan was actually not built at the time. Uh, so it was, there was a, a areas on the, on the islands which were completely, well, basically huts, nothing more than huts. And then the restaurants close at 8 p.m. The one restaurant on the whole beach closes at 8 p.m. and that's it. And, and no internet connectivity even though I was working in IT at the time already. So actually, to be fair, there was a, in the back room of the restaurant, there was an internet connectivity of speed of like 56 bytes or whatever. <laughs> so if there's a super emergency on, on work or during your summer vacation, you, they can actually reach you. But <laughs> it's like back in the day when you send a fax and it gets there tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you enjoy cooking? Uh, no, no, I'm not really a good cooker. I'm, I'm really famous of actually failing all <laughs> that stuff. I can, I can do steaks uh, and grilling. So uh, you like grilling? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's right. Favorite thing to grill? Ah, oh, good question. Uh, chicken. Maybe. Hmm? I like chicken. I'm more of a red meat guy though. I'm a big steak guy. Ah, uh, yeah, I never was big chicken. Same. Yeah. So, speaking of food, what, what's the food, food like? Where you're from? What, what's your favorite thing, thing um, to eat? And well, that's that's the one thing where people might actually even get like horrified. But, but <laughs> <laughs> the best food in Finland is actually reindeer. Hmm. But then reindeer is of, it's, it is built. The reindeer's purpose is to be food, actually, yep. and and the fur. Uh, and but then there are people who are like, no, you're eating brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I assume it's very much like venison. Yep. Like deer here, yeah, yeah, yep. but it's it's really well. There's there is a clear difference, uh, but it's it's really great. Yep. So, hmm. so if ru if uh, reindeer are considered horses somewhere, Chris Kent's heart is hurting. <laughs> 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 so do you uh, do you like to pair? You mentioned your f favorite way to end a hard day's work is red wine. Yeah, uh, any that's particular true. kind of. Um, I like cabs um, because they have plenty of taste, um, so they need to be not some juices. So, <laughs> <laughs> Some, something robust and yeah, yeah. I'm a big cab cab guy myself. You, unfortunately, you don't drink. Yeah, so it's all which is great for great for me because we go to all these events and you get little drink to drink tickets oh, and then I, I, I get two. Oh yeah, I just <laughs> hand it over. Yeah. And or I I'm have always the designated driver. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's like, oh, David can go for sure. I'm like, wait a second, do you want me to go or am I just the driver? <laughs> do you do a lot of wine tasting and stuff when you travel? Uh, no, no. Um, I intentionally not really, I, it's not the stuff where I, where I want to actually spend time on. So, uh, and anyway, when I'm traveling, uh, for me, um, for example, this week is this is just work, 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 work. Uh, so, uh, or in Las Vegas, when I go SPC, uh, I just, in my mind, my ethics has been built and I've been raised in a way that I can't actually enjoy because I'm working. working. So, in, I'm in, if I'm in Las Vegas, I'm not going to go any of the shows because that would be wrong against my family, which is weird because my wife is even saying that, no, 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 enjoy. I said, no, I can't. The, ah. there, there is also a chance that his boss might listen to this show. <laughs> no, so. no, 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 <laughs> that's fine. Ed is awesome. Yeah. Ed, Ed understands things. So. Now, I, I feel the same way, though, and I don't know if this is the line you were thinking about, but uh, when I travel, I mean, as you well know, we all travel a lot, so we build up points and, and benefits and uh, all that kind of stuff. I never use it without okaying it with my wife. Even though I'm the one that worked and accumula accumulated the points, I always say, do you mind if I use this? I feel like I should be using it when we're together. Yeah. And it's always the same story, probably. Just about, no, use it. You deserve it. Yeah. You yeah. But I always feel bad. Yeah. yeah. So I'm never really out doing a whole lot, especially with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hmm. It doesn't feel right for the family. But, but again, I don't judge the people who do that. Um, that's completely fine to do that. It's just in my mind, my ethics, uh, whatever is, is telling me that that is not the thing you are allowed to do. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that other people would not be allowed to do that. I'm fine with that. So, it's so, so on that topic, you go to Lapland a lot, but do you go, it, are there other favorite places you bring your family that you guys go to? Because in the U US, we like to travel. We travel all, sure. all of the place. Sure. Disney World, Disneyland, which, you know, places people go but is there for you you guys is there that kind of equi equivalent that you know families go to in Europe so in our case I, I we've been actually traveling the world uh, well of, of, at some point I was traveling like 26 28 weeks in a, in a year which was horrible uh, then you see places like Kuala Lumpur and, and whatever America throughout Europe all of the cities and, and in Asia in many cases as well uh, 
Uh, and I, I like in 2008, we got a or I got it the Platinum Platinum Club Award from Microsoft. Uh, it's been all downhill since. Uh, <laughs> so, but that was actually a trip, family trip to the Hawaii. Uh, we didn't have a kids at the time, but it was basically me and wife, and then company paid for it. And we were in Lanai in Four Seasons Hotel for five to six days. Which is cool and it's, it's brilliant and it's it's nice to see those locations. Uh, last year we were in Dubai for a few weeks, uh, well, uh, one week, and then Mediterranean cruise. But then at the same time, even our kid is saying, "Can we actually stay in Finland? <laughs> can we enjoy the, the 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 fact that we can drive from one location to another and stay in a different hotel, a spa hotel, hopefully that he can actually go and swim?" And uh, so he actually has even he has started saying that well, we're traveling too much. <laughs> And it's nice to see places, but it's like, well, it's different. Um, and especially, in, at least in my case, I've, I've been all around the world. I don't really need to go anywhere Not a whole lot anymore. of new for you to no, see. No, no. I could go to Barcelona for sixth time or whatever, which I love. The city is awesome. But it's like, there would be nothing new here. So why would I? Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's impressive. It, it's exhausting to travel too, right? True. I mean, I have two kids, and, and at the end of a trip, we're just like, why didn't we not just stay home and go <laughs> to the movies? <laughs> <laughs> the, one place, the one place where I definitely want to go again is uh, Venice. Venice is just that, just brilliant. Um, that, that's almost the same thing as when you go to the Lapland, because the Venice is such a unique place. You end up in a city, you're sitting there, you're like, this isn't real, right? This, because there are mm. no, no, no cars, no nothing, everything is in boats and, mm. and all of that stuff. And, and then the, the buildings are super old. Um, you're like in a completely different location, in a completely different movie or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's the thing that I enjoy. Born and raised in Los Angeles, there's not much history there when sure. it comes to buildings and stuff like that. So I love New York and then going east to Europe. I mean, if, if earthquakes don't get a, do away with the buildings, then you know designers are going to build new buildings anyway. So yep. I think seeing the things like that are surreal because all you do is see pictures of it your entire yep. life. Yep. And then you see it in person, it's like, wait, is this real? Yep. Mm. Yeah. And you're getting ready to go to Italy. Yeah, we just booked trips the other day to Switzerland and Italy. We're going to kind of stay in the north wine country and hang out, hang out around Milan and yep. that area. But we're my first time over there, so we'll be... We need to ping Paolo, uh, Paolo mm. He's living in, in Milan. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And he, he, well, yeah, the, the northern Italy is different than southern yep. Italy, and, and he, he's a super friendly guy as well. So yeah. yeah, our whole thing was like, the tourism the thing doesn't interest us, so going to Rome or seeing Pisa like doesn't really interest us. Yep. I really like wine. I really like cheese. I want to eat some good food, and so it was like Italy was the place play, place to go. And yep. so that's my uh, I just you know, I just turned thirty this year, so it's my my I'm big so three O trip. It's all downhill from here now, right? Just nothing left. <laughs> so old. <laughs> I used to be the youngest uh, guy. I <laughs> felt you too. Hey, I I woke up sore this morning. Okay. Oh. So I don't <laughs> I'm already feeling it. Young problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you had mentioned that your favorite band is Daft Punk. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it that you love about their music? Well, so I listened, in quotes, whatever the EDM was before EDM was EDM. So I, I was a trans, dis uh, not a disco, trans, what is it? Uh, rave guy mm. uh, when I was younger uh, not because of actually any of the, the downside of doing that but rather from the music I, I really enjoy electronic music uh, if they're being done properly so there's multiple uh, tracks going at the same time yep. and you can hear that they've actually really thought about the story behind of the, the, the music so it's not just dun 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 yeah. dun dun mm. dun, but there's actually a really story behind of it um, and for me those are actually really really great composers even though they do their stuff on computers. Sure. Um, and when I started working in IT back in 96, or <laughs> uh, 95 maybe. Uh, I, I, I think I had just learned to walk then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was still in high school. At least I've got that. <laughs> right, so. Oh, I'm so old. Um, <laughs> Bogue does that to me all the time, though. He, yeah. I'm like, did you ever see this movie? He's like, well, I was born when it came out. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> leave. <laughs> But yeah, so when I started working, uh, there was a Ministry of Sound radio was one of the things which were in the internet, like 99, 98. Uh, they streamed on the, on the, let's say, EDM music. It wasn't called EDM at the time uh, because it was such a smaller group of people listening uh, electronic music. Um, and then Daft Punk, uh, the first songs came in like 2002 or something like that. The old ones are much better than the new ones. Yeah. The new one is good, but it's already, that's even a six years old uh, album. Uh, but there's a there's a kind of a 
I used to work with headphones on and just listening music, uh, which is kind of a zoning, zoning me out from the outside of the office. I was going to ask about that because uh, Daft Punk from the Tron Legacy album is yep. one of my favorite, and I have a whole collection of playlists that are just for when I'm heads down developing. Yep. That's nothing but like movie scores, and, and they have a lot there. Uh, because the words and songs tend to distract me yep. when I'm trying to focus on code, and I was curious if there's any connection between yep. that and Daft Punk for you. Yep. It, it is the EDM music and the electronic music was for me the way to concentrate when I'm actually coding and, and writing stuff. So now that I'm a PM or principal PM especially, I'm not allowed to code anymore. So He says that, but I, I have a candid photo from you at uh, SPC where you had VS Code <laughs> open and it was, I almost tweeted it. I was like, ah, oh, well, no, I want to. He was, sure. he was fi fixing demos. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's what it was. It was just... Paint. Yeah. He was working in paint. It was yeah. someone else's screenshot. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, if you had not been working in SharePoint, you had mentioned that you thought about being a psychologist or a yep. youth leader. Yep. So what was the tipping point? Like, what pushed you into IT versus... Well, I, I still remember I actually applied on the youth leader uh, school, and then... <laughs> Uh, because I, I really enjoyed uh, spending time in, uh, with the younger kids and, uh, and helping them on summer camps and, and those things. So I did that for a few years, uh, which was fun. Um, and then uh, I applied and I, in the, the whatever the applied, uh, there was everybody who was applying were in the tests and they were doing group tests. And I'm, I'm always sitting there. My, my way of always working is that I, I'm, when I'm sitting in a room, I first analyze the people, not intentionally, not being a psychopath, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but more I'm not the vocal person uh, because I, I'm actually an introvert. This is just an act. Uh, so um, to be honest, I'm, I'm definitely an introvert. So I'd rather kind of a think my role in the room and in the group and let other people to actually take their roles. And then I start helping on, on making things happen. But in the youth, uh, youth tests, the group tests, uh, so people were doing random stuff, they couldn't actually make anything happen, and then at some point I'm like, okay, I can't curse on this show. <laughs> um, like, oh, okay, let me actually take the lead. And then I started doing the leading and everything else, and apparently that was the wrong thing to do, because <laughs> I didn't give them any opportunity on, on making the group exam, uh, whatever the task was. So it was basically me being too practical and to like, you'll do that, you'll do that, you'll do that, and then, well, that doesn't work with you people, because mm -hmm. you need to figure out your way of things. Um, then I applied, I think I applied for being a teacher at some point as well. So I was a substitute teacher for a long time uh, in different schools uh, when I was young. So I needed, needed the money. Um, and you still had kids. I I that. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. He's really my wife good. worked he, at a school. He's really good at tell, telling his kids what to do. <laughs> 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 they use Project and VS yeah. Code and GitHub for all yeah. of the planning. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. But yeah, so, and then I was actually working five years in a casino as well. I don't know if I wrote that one down. No, so that's a whole other <laughs> segment that we need to include. What did you do in a casino? So I started as a croupier, uh, so basically doing roulettes and blackjacks and, and red dog and, and all of that. The poker thing wasn't a big thing at the time yet. So, and then I browsed, uh, I grew to be whatever the, what is it, the, 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 the small middle manager on the on the casino as well, and they on the floor on the floor, yeah. yeah, yeah. So and they even offered me a well in Finland the casinos are slightly different. Uh, they're smaller. They're in the the shopping malls, and it's controlled by the government. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, all of that money is actually getting to the charities directly. Oh, uh, which is a great thing. So it's a, a nice thing. On the other hand, it's a monopoly owned by the government, and so it's not a necessarily a good thing either. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but then they actually even offered me a, I think they offered me a leadership of a certain area which would have been a s multiple casino, small casinos and a slot machine locations. And at that point it's like, do I want to go IT? And do I want to stay in here? Mm. And I decided to go in IT. And this is the real re reason he doesn't go out in Vegas because he knows <laughs> he knows the house always wins. Yes, that's that's right. true as well. That yeah. is true. <laughs> I do not play. So yeah. I, I, I don't gamble. So. Yeah. Me neither. Yeah, I don't either. I don't find find the joy of losing money. It's just, uh, yeah. Well, and I work hard enough for it. I don't need to just give it away to get yeah. twice it back. Yeah, it's not worth it. So we we pulled the community uh, for some questions, sure. and so we're just going to ask them as they ask them. Uh, you're well known for orange being your favorite color. We see it in Parker. We see it in your shirt. We appreciate you wearing the you know the Thank you. community yeah. close-up colors today. That was awesome. <laughs> um, how did orange become your favorite color? Is there um, a history there? Um, it, uh, to be honest, when I was 18, so I, I 
technically, and we don't need to go all of the, the background things and all of that, but at the age of 18, I, I actually moved uh, on my own. Uh, so, and then when I created my and, and did my own first flat, I actually, it was a pink yellow, uh, the, door, <laughs> the, the inside walls, because the yellow was my favorite color at the time. And then it morphs at some point to be orange from the yellow. Um, I still remember when the, the guys were visiting, and I was like, what the... Is this an Eastern house, house or what? What, what have you done? <laughs> no, no. Yellow is my favorite color. What? But I, I, I don't know. I, I like the orange uh, color, and then uh, I, I bought a car based on a color as well. So I, I basically, because I work from home, I in Finland as Microsoft employees, we would actually get a lease car. But because I work from home, it would, doesn't make any sense. So I, I bought a new car, and we chose the car based on the selection of the color. So Plot twist: He's colorblind, and his favorite color is blue. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> you're in good company. I have an orange car too, and my I, I was curious about that as well, just because I orange is one, orange and purple are my two favorite, and orange is because I love fall and all that kind of stuff. So it, it kind of ties in. Which surprised me because you aren't wearing anything orange. Today. No, no, I'm doing my SharePoint teal. outfit today. Oh, SharePoint here. shoes. Yeah. Teal. Yep. Yeah. 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 yeah, the Air cool. Force Ones. You and Jeff Teeper there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one of the more popular things people notice is when you're presenting, there's no shoes. So I, I'm pretty sure we know the answer to this, but the community <laughs> may not. So the question was, why do you not wear shoes in presenting? Um, that has a slightly longer historical reason as well. So when I was doing MCM, instru I was an MCM instructor, so Microsoft Certified Master for SharePoint for 18 rotations. Uh, I was actually the only instructor who was in for, for the first rotation until the last one, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, there was even a rotation where Irvin Van Hoonen was, he still keeps on uh, being annoyed on that one, is that they flew to Redmond uh, and they paid 18,000 to get to the training. And, and obviously then there's like 20 different uh, instructors during those three weeks, like 12 instructors or so. I have two days and my wife was pregnant. So I said, yeah, I'm not going to fly. Hmm. So I, I <laughs> they were sitting <laughs> in a room in Redmond and I was delivering remotely from Finland, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which man. is kind of awkward. <laughs> I, I'm sensing a theme here. Vesa seems to get whatever he wants. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, so in the MCM, when we are in the room, uh, it's, it's definitely one of the smartest people in the room, much smarter than I am, uh, because it's, the MCM wasn't really about us, us teaching. It's more of a facilitating the discussion mm -hmm. uh, in the room because people uh, learn from each other, which is what we want to do with community as well. Uh, but in the room, when people have studying three weeks massively to the final exam of the MCM, you need to start being able to do something, let's say, surprising. And it actually started from that room that I, I just kicked out my, my shoes so I can actually just out of blue jump on a table. And it, because I don't want to put my shoes on a table because that would be just rude. So I can jump on a table and I, I did it quite a few times or, or people really wake up on their chairs when you jump on a table and but you don't change. You just keep on talking on the same tone and, and explaining the technology. And everybody's like, what the... <laughs> <laughs> now, before you go to a new place, do you test out the, the structural integrity in of the table? <laughs> you, you usually ask, though, right? You've asked before. In SPC, I asked, yeah. So in Las Vegas this year in SPC, when I jumped on a table, I asked that, is it fine if I jump on here? Because that was a proper stage. It was a big stage. And then um, on that one, by the way, I still remember when when I jumped from the table on the air, I kind of remembered, oh, yeah, I don't have shoes. So this is going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I didn't just drop down. I actually no, jumped. No, you jumped. The <laughs> yeah. It was a leap. Yeah. <laughs> so adding to the no shoes, there's, a, th there's something very uh, unique about you as well. Um, are you sponsored by pol polo or do you just <laughs> like polo shirts? <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> It's, it's one of those things, like, without shoes, it's, it's comfort. Uh, it, it makes me feel more natural. Uh, the polos, I used to be a principal consultant in Microsoft Consulting Services. I wear my, whatever, the, the proper suits and everything else. And now that I'm a PM, I don't need to be as properly dressed, mm -hmm. and which is more relaxed. So polos is just the easy way to look, in quotes, smart uh, and clean <laughs> without having a too much hassle uh, on making sure that it's ironed out and all of that. So... I have like 50 polos from <laughs> Pro Florin. Uh, and then I, uh, last year, the, or this year, I realized, oh, you can actually order uh, custom polos. Oh, that's cool. So yeah. I started ordering those. <laughs> but it's just a super convenient and easy way to save time because you don't have to worry about what I can wear. So we were, we were jo joking in preparation for this podcast. Um, after we are done, we're going to send out a Twitter poll, and it's going to be who wore it best. And it, it's going to be Scott Goo or... 
Vesta, because you're both known for having your shirts. Fair point. Fair point. I do have a red polo as well, but I don't wear it um, yeah. because I would, that would be <laughs> jumping on Scott <laughs> <laughs> section. Don't want to compete. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the well, another community question was um, less. It was more, 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 more of an in-depth question. Um, we know you tra travel and you work a lot. It seems like you work 24 hours a day. So how do you maintain, how are you able to maintain a work-life balance? Um, there must be some secret sauce um, because you're always working, traveling, and making time for the hobbies that you do have. Sure. Um, so because of actually the, one of the tricks is the fact that I work from home, uh, from Finland. Uh, because for me, uh, when I wake up in the morning, get the coffee, uh, uh, go and say have a great school for the kid and after that it's basically doing some quick checkup on the on the internet and social media if there's anything urgent or whatever in the email and uh, then we go out then I go out with the dog and and well that's my day-to-day -day kind of uh, exercise thing as well I, I go out for one hour or so uh, a few times in a day um, but then when I get back it's already it's like 10 a.m. in the morning and my meeting starts typically at 5 p.m. so then I am really kind of a relaxed timing for the following whatever six five hours I can be as productive as I want or or if needed I can go to the, my kids school and help with the with the kids or whatever is needed so every now and then they ask help on the ice skating or whatever in the and, and I can I have the flexibility of doing that which actually is one of the key reasons why I enjoy my my work and job because I have this flexibility and then uh, on evenings from five until like 10 or 11 in my time Sure, I'm booked on meetings from Monday to Thursday. And that's actually basically then the reason why I don't really much that much time to do any hobbies. Uh, on Mondays or Tuesdays, I actually have a family time. So on the afternoon as well, booked on Wednesday, Thursday, I'm basically working the whole day. So, but, it, but again, it gives the flexibility. If I need to go to bank, if I need to do any business, or whatever family things, I can do that during daytime. <laughs> and then Friday is completely off starting from 5 p.m. and then weekends I try to prioritize family. And that way you don't get called or pinged or whatever while you're out doing, helping yep. with the ice skating? Yeah, that's true. That's true as well. So, nice. so, and we talked about this quite a few times with, uh, with wife as well. Um, if you have the normal 8 to 4 time or 8 to 4 office hours, whatever, or 9 to 5, you actually start driving to her office at 7 a.m., 7.30, you get to the office, you'll be there. Um, most likely, in my case, I always overworked. Uh, it's just a habit. Uh, I like what I do, and I, I, I'm an improvingist, so I am always keep on improving mm -hmm. things, and then I get lost on time. So I would be arriving home like 6, 7, 8 p.m., which basically would mean that I have to be away the whole day. So now when the kid actually gets out of school, he can come on the afternoon with his friends to our home and then I need to wear noise cancellation <laughs> to be able to work. But it, it has that more flexible way of accessing the family as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in a super lucky position. Uh, people always say that, well, you work, your working hours are massive, but it's like, yeah, but I don't understand what would be the, the different way of doing this. Mm. Now, because you are the only remote and everyone else is in Seattle, yep, right? pretty much, yeah. Um, they don't always know what time it is for you. True. And true. so that means you've had to schedule sleep on yep, your calendar. So that is true. The first person <laughs> I've ever met who had to put sleep on his calendar, <laughs> which is amazing. But it, it is there just to indicate for people that they don't need to actually think uh, that, oh, yeah, he's the remote guy, but I'm not available. Right. Uh, and then for anybody, I always say that, well, if you can find a free spot in my calendar, take it. And they'll uh, take it if it's not already, yeah. it could be the middle exactly. of your night. Exactly. Well, you exactly. said a free spot. Yeah. 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 So we are going to introduce a new segment into our podcast, and so you are our guinea pig for it. Um, it's going to be called Rapid Fire and fill, fill in the Blank. I was hoping singing. Yeah. Well, no, <laughs> we could do that too. <laughs> no, 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 that no. comes no. after. <laughs> <laughs> so the first set it is Rapid Fire, yes or no, or not yes or no, one, one or the other, and then a fill in the blank sure. at the end. So it's going to be really fast. So are you ready? Scary. All right. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Coffee. Wine or beer? Wine. Treadmill or couch? A treadmill. Texting or talking? Uh, texting. <laughs> cake, cake or pie? Uh, pie. Summer or winter? Summer. Ask for permission or beg for forgiveness? I beg for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> more time or more money? Uh, time. All right. If only one artist, if only one artist on your play playlist, who w who would that be? That would be the Daft Punk. Yep. The best ice cream flavor is uh, strawberry. The first topping on pizza should be half cheese. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no sauce, no nothing. It's just cheese and bread. <laughs> yes. uh, if you could have one superpower, it would be? Ah, that's hard. Uh, flying. Flying. And we're done. That was good. Yeah, that was interesting. So <laughs> you, you hesitated, though, on summer or winter. I, I would have thought that in a heartbeat it would have been summer over winter. Um, well, it's not always the case. So the, the winter, in especially if it gets snow in Helsinki, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. I, I just, it's insanely beautiful. Um, so, And there's more light. The, the, the snow has a... Those who are living in the northern areas and they get snow, they understand the fact that whenever right now in October, November, it's just dark. So we're having, in the worst case scenario in Helsinki, we'll be having Black Friday on every Friday from October until March. <laughs> <laughs> so having the snow on ground, uh, on ground, uh, it, it just multiplies the light. Mm. Which uh, is the, the complete opposite of when we interviewed Sci Simon. It was like midnight and it was just bright outside. Yeah. Right? So like it was middle so of the day. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't imagine. Yeah, that was on summertime. Yeah, it was summertime. No, no, no yeah, 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 exactly. But that's that's the variation. Everybody is just, but it's always so dark in Finland. Well, actually, no. Summertime. It's, it's always so light. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And we, we were trying to guess which you would pick on some of these, ask permission or beg for forgiveness. We both felt that it would be beg for forgiveness. Yeah. 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 I don't, well, so, so the job, what I do, it's, it's always one of those things where I get asked quite often uh, that, hey, Pesar, so I have a career uh, discussion so ongoing, um, and I would like to go and do whatever you're doing for a living. So what is the career path in Microsoft to get there? It's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 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 there is no. Yeah, yeah, but what's the role? What is the role? What's it? I'm a PM, but not what I, I'm not a typical PM because yeah. I'm doing quite a different thing. So. Go to work at a casino first, <laughs> yep. and then substitute <laughs> teacher. <laughs> yep. Get back to me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, so you've uh, you've got a couple sessions this week, one tomorrow and one Thursday, I believe, right? Do I have a session tomorrow? It's a short one. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, it's like the a theater session. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's I think the that's whatever. to promote Thursday, yeah, right? Correct, correct. It's like 15 minutes discussion on what's the latest and what we're going to cover in Thursday, which is 45 minutes, which is tough. Yes, so. yeah. That is short. Anything you want to promote? Uh, well, that. obviously, a lot of the announcements actually happened already uh, yesterday. We actually, so we are super fast on SP Dev Weekly because we need to have to. And uh, we already released the, the latest SharePoint Dev Weekly where we go through some of the announcements from yesterday, which is which is kind of rushing, yeah. but hey, it is what it is. But uh, really, the big things for us from a community and open source perspective uh, is the lookbook SharePoint.com, uh, sorry, lookbook.microsoft.com. And under under the hood, it's using the provisioning the SharePoint PMP.com, which is the provisioning service to automate all of those cool looking uh, portals and, and modern sites to be provisioned any tenant it will. Um, and that's actually fully open source. So even the templates and the assets and images used on the templates are open source. So you can actually go to the GitHub, pull down the templates, even though you wouldn't want to use the, the website, you can use the templates using PowerShell. So you can bypass all of that permission thing is something else. That's definitely the area where we spent most time on this autumn to make stuff happen. Uh, so we were able to get that integration to work and, and more reliable provisioning, definitely. Hmm. Are you going to open source some of those templates, the ability for community to build templates into it? I know that that, yeah. that was like a maybe, maybe not type of thing, but... So um, so everything is... Open. So we it's source open from our perspective, and the challenge really is that potentially we could actually open the service as say, hey, get your own template in here, and that would actually be an interesting scenario kind of an open sourcing uh, exposing custom templates and then even companies actually providing their own functionalities on the templates maybe even having licensed functionalities in them and all of that mm. the challenge is really that uh, the are which I understand really well our design doesn't want uh, a bad quality templates to get leaked through uh, on those services because then that might actually have an impact on the on the let's say the 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 end result uh, of the of the usage, sure. uh, and so for now it's only limited for Microsoft on templates and the service itself. Now everybody keeps on, keeps on asking that yeah it would be really cool if I could sign in and just upload my PMP file to the service and it would provision that for me, which is like yeah I get that mm -hmm. I, I I get that. Uh, we'll see if we get there at some point. Uh, it is it's one of those things which are kind of a hey that's an interesting scenario. Yeah. So. Yeah, so we're talking about PMP. I think mo probably most people who are going to listen to to this have some idea of what PMP is. Um, you're one of the found founding f fathers of it. Um, can you talk about that a bit? The in where it came from, sure. and you know where you see it go going. Yeah. yeah. 
so and I'm going to talk about this one on Thursday morning as well. But this podcast doesn't go out before Thursday. But um, so technically, it might. is that a problem? No, <laughs> <laughs> we can wait. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, if you think about the mentality and thinking, is that that actually I, I joined Microsoft in 2006, and it's horrifying. It's 13 years. Uh, uh, of doing this, but when I joined, uh, I actually really seriously thought that my, this is my career peaking. Uh, I'm going to be here. Uh, they will kick me out because I'm not good enough. Uh, I, I have a massive fear of, uh, of missing out. The, the imposter, imposter syndrome. syndrome. Yep. Um, so whenever they will catch me, and I, I wasn't, uh, I, I didn't know SharePoint before, so they, they made a chance on me that hey, he seems like a smart guy. Uh, you'll be a SharePoint consultant for the customers, and I was horrified and they will kick me out within a few weeks so I studied and studied and, and, and spent hours countless hours of studying uh, SharePoint and then I realized that well actually not all of Microsoft employees are superman supermen or superwomen either and apparently they actually don't know everything either which is cool um, but one of the things one what really kind of a trick uh, or, or is important for me and from that studying and trying to bang your head against the wall trying to figure out uh, how things work was that there was no documentation there was no guidance there was no sample uh, for SharePoint 2007 we had no clue what is a farm solution because Microsoft had hadn't done any documentation out of it so it was really about trial and error trying to figure out what is the story which was silly because Microsoft should explain how these things can be done, what is the right thing to do, how, uh, how it's intended to use and all of that. Um, so when I then started doing reusable training materials, uh, which we used uh, locally in Microsoft uh, Finland, and those actually got, I shared them globally as well, and then they got traction because they were really about explaining farm solutions, how do you do that, and how do you version them, how do you create feature XMLs, and then that landed me on the MCM program because I was the specialist of XMLs. Um, at some point then, the SharePoint add-ins world, uh, add-in world came, which was actually kind of interesting time as well because the add-ins can work in the cloud, farm solutions do not work in the cloud, so we needed to come up with a guidance on how do we transition from the classic farm solutions to the adding world. And a lot of that guidance then grew to be the first pieces of BMP, kind of, because why wouldn't we actually share the, the code and examples and, and how do we make X and Y C happen on the adding world? Yeah, do it is, rather than the farm solution way of doing that. Um, and that's then just evolved to be whatever it is basically today. But it really started, as say, uh, from the SharePoint add-in uh, reusable components. We started sharing those first internally. And then at some point, marketing was like, hey, you guys have interesting stuff here, which would drive adoption of the cloud. And I said, yeah, sure. Let's put it in Codeplex. Let's put it in, in GitHub. And then it started from there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you often ask, uh, I, I know you just asked Gary on the SPW Weekly a week ago, uh, when someone says that should be all Microsoft's responsibility. Yep. Do you get a lot of that? Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Th it's interesting to me because I think that that's so short-sighted, right? Well, sure, and and that's that's I think that was one of the different data for the PMP initiative as such is that it was based on a real-world ex experiences. So we worked with the largest enterprises in the world to transition them from farm solutions to the adding, and everything what we build as a proof of concept, as a sample, as a learning, we actually shared it out as an open source. Um, sure. It's kind of uh, owned by Microsoft still, uh, and sure, Microsoft should have end-to-end -end guidances on everything, but it's a resourcing challenge as well. Um, but, and also, if it's only Microsoft people in Richmond who are doing this, they don't work with customers. So they do not have the day-to-day -day experience mm -hmm. um, on how, what, what, what are the amazing stuff what customers have built on top of SharePoint. So they, they wouldn't be able to explain that in the same way as the people who work in the community with the customers on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and it's a pure numbers game too, right? Sure. It's like if one company, yes, they may say, well, this is Microsoft's responsibility to do this. But if they contribute to the greater good, but then there's hundreds of thousands of other companies contributing yep. back in, they benefit way more than anything they would have just gotten by themselves yep. from Microsoft. Okay. And I think that leads to what I believe is there's, there's three types of people on the SharePoint development side in regards to P PMP, it's the people who know it, and we love it, and we use it every single day because we see the val value in it. There's people who don't know it, right, which is why we have these podcasts and why you present about P P PMP. Um, and then there's others in, um, who are a little scared. I've, we present our PMP talk at all the SharePoint Saturday events, and um, we had one where someone came up after and said, you know, do you trust these open source things? Like, I see vulnerabilities and 
things like that. Do you have any advice for people like us who are promoting it to kind of ease some of the fears of obviously don't install something that you haven't checked through yeah. thor thoroughly, right? That's number one rule of op open source. But um, anything you can kind of help to ease some of the anxiety that, that companies might have about adopting open source? Yeah. So. It is understandable, definitely understandable, let's say, concern. Uh, you need to understand what you're installing, absolutely, like you said. Then at the same time, if it's a stable, let's say, established open source uh, functionality, like PMP PowerShell is a good example. It's being used 27,000 tenants in every single month, which is like, wow. Uh, you, you can actually bet on it, and if there's any critical things, uh, on the or even though it's open source, if there's any critical things, of course Microsoft will jump in and, and start doing the best whatever it can. Now, if we think about open source in general, .NET Framework is open source. Um, sure. it, it's no longer, I, I say, let's say, it can, this kind of a monster behind of the scenes. It is open source, it's being supported by Microsoft. The BMP, a lot of the BMP is not supported by, well, supported by Microsoft, but you can't call to a support and say, hey, I have this problem. Um, the reason why you cannot or you, do that, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> or me, yeah. And the reason why you cannot actually do that is quite simply our support engineers do not have experience even on dev, sure. because you can't even call on the on the support and say, hey, this Arduino API doesn't work, and they will say, yeah, sorry, I can't help. Yeah. So, which is which is weird, and, and it's a fair comment. Maybe somebody said Microsoft should fix this, and they should have a proper support, and that's true. And, and yes, we are trying to fix that. Uh, but it, it's the realities of life right now where we live in uh, are, let's say, almost like open source ish, even for out of the box functionality. Sure. So that's why, well, that's definitely not, not one of the reasons why PMP exists, but that's, that's a good thing that it exists as a community because when something breaks, then the other people will jump in. Yeah. Bo is a good example. You, you, you are spending a lot of time on the issue list, on, on the SP dev, dev docs or Stata Kid, helping on the, on, the, on the issues that people sure. are having. Um, but it's, it's just numbers game, like David said. Uh, we just don't have enough resources on helping with all of the questions. Yeah, so, so where do you see PNP go, going? Ah, we're extending things. Uh, so one of the things Mark D. Anderson is, is looking into doing, or started doing successfully already, the, the community documentation for non-dev stuff. Um, that's going to be surfaced in the official docs sooner or later, uh, which is slightly confusing as well, because then, hey, if it's in official docs, is it actually supported? What does it actually mean? But it, it's, it's one of those things where, as long as we are clear from a positioning perspective, uh, in the, that should be super clear. Uh, we're also extending the PMP thinking um, on top of SharePoint. Uh, originally, PMP was actually Office 365 developer PMP. Yep. Uh, then I, when I moved to the, the when it was ownership was moved from the CAT team to the actual SharePoint engineering, it was repositioned as SharePoint PMP because we wanted to land SharePoint Framework. And we've been pretty successful at landing SharePoint Framework. So now it's getting more extended on, on the wider areas. So Fluid Framework, uh, the Office 365 or Microsoft 365 components, what, or what, whatever we'll call them in the future, uh, is the next step of SharePoint framework, uh, which is getting the same tool set. Don't get scared or anything like that, but it's getting more widely used on Teams and, and Office settings. So, of course, we'll then extend our community efforts on that side as well. Sure. Because it's definitely not just about SharePoint. SharePoint is, is a, it's not a small piece, but it, it is a piece of the puzzle when you're building enterprise grade applications in the in Microsoft 365. Yeah, and, and when you guys look at the collaboration behind PNP, um, obviously you have the telemetry and everything. I'm assuming, because we've talked about this before, there's a wide spectrum between consumers and contributors, yep. right? Yep. And, and so I think, as we all know, there's a lot of initiatives that we're all involved with in trying to get more people to collaborate and contribute. But again, it, if you get a bigger level of contributors, then you're going to get a bigger level of consumers as well. Yep. So everything grows. Yep. But I assume there's a wide gap there. And absolutely. Absolutely. There, there is, so what's a good thing is nowadays, clearly, people are more aware of the BMP because for years, that was the problem. It's like, and when you show them, they were like, whoa, there's so much value out of this, uh, even though it's open source and all of that. And uh, nowadays, people are clearly much more aware of how it is. Um, but that's the, the long-term play. Mm -hmm. and, and quite often, even in Microsoft, people are always betting, OK, you need to make these numbers by end of this fiscal, or otherwise, this whole thing is gone. It's like, no, 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 no. This is a long-term play. You need to keep on having a consistent message um, and keep on improving and making sure that every single week when people come back to whatever open source initiatives or your blog post, they can say, oh, there's new stuff. Because sure. that guarantees, that gives the indication that, okay, this is a safe thing to bet on. It's active. Yeah. It's active. It's not going to go away. 
Um, and that's that's the one thing where, where, where even in Microsoft level we keep on failing uh, in, in here and there. Um, and that's something which we definitely want the other organizations to learn uh, from the success of, of BMP as well and also extending that to the, to the other areas. Uh, because having the developer ecosystem uh, around your product, is it in Teams, Office add-ins or SharePoint, it's super important um, because the developers actually build then enterprise applications which also drives, by the way, stickiness to the, the, the our products, which is a positive thing for Microsoft, and then it drives uh, the usage uh, for the enterprise's users as well. Yep. So the developers actually have a massive impact uh, on the success of the of the ecosystem as well. And yep. quite often, unfortunately, even some of the feature crews don't understand that. Yeah. Because missing APIs, and you're like, what, why? Sure, and so I think that's, we're wrapping up on time here, but I think sure. that's a good segue into um, our final, um, commentary here. Um, PMP, everyone see, sees it from the outside, they might see you, um, but there's a huge team of, of community members who contribute to it. Um, and then as you said before, there's a there's a difference between people who contribute and then people who re reuse. Um, and so we, we wanted to kind of uh, illustrate the effect that PMP has and the effect that, that, that you've had on our community. Um, and so we wanted to get, get you a gift um, or make you a gift. And so David and I got together a couple weeks ago and said, well, how could we um, do something and illustrate in a way that shows you the positive impact you've had on us, on the community, uh, on the development for SharePoint in general. So um, we built an app to go to Twitter and search and pull down all the pictures of profiles, um, screenshots, um, pictures from events that were tagged with SPFX, PNP, Office Dev. SharePoint um, Saturdays. SharePoint Saturdays. Yep. And so we pulled down thousands of pic pictures. Um, we had also asked you to provide us with a photo of yourself. Um, so what we did was we built a mosaic image of yourself um, that, is com no <laughs> 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 that is comprised of all wow. the community members um, who have talked about or worked with PNP, Office Dev, P PMP. And so we wanted to give you this gift for your desk um, that wow. you can see. Uh, yeah, so it's basically thousands of community members and you can see pictures or screenshots. Um, so cool. we wanted to say thank you for all that you do for the community. Um, and we really appreciate um, the support that you the really support provide. That, that you really you. provide. Yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you. So there's even little vests in there too, believe it or not. <laughs> 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 wow, these are really small. This is really cool. This is really, really cool. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks uh, for being on the show. Not a problem. Not a problem. These things are the, the I'm, I'm a fan. So for me, it's, 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 to be fair, it's always like, uh, you don't have to thank me. This is what I do for a living. <laughs> uh, if, if somebody is happy on, on our results, that's, that's great. And uh, that's really the, the, the way it's supposed to be. Right. right. Sure. Yeah. So before well, we'll, we'll tweet it out yeah. too, for those on the podcast and the webinar that didn't, can't see the details. So yeah. we'll, we'll share it if you're okay with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, before we wrap up, anything else? Yeah, we wanted to add that, uh, thank everybody for listening to the podcast. Uh, we're recording at Microsoft Ignite and Microsoft is giving away a Microsoft Surface earbuds to listeners. So if you'd like to enter, visit HTTPS, uh, AKA dot MS podcast sweepstakes. Uh, it's insensitive. Uh, you just need to enter before December 15th, 2019. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. your time today, Vesa. Not a problem. Great. I enjoyed it. Thank you.